Hello, watch enthusiasts. Now, today I'd like to talk about the, the history of the Rolex Sea Dweller in a continuation of this Story of an Icon series. And I haven't made one of these videos in a while, but I feel that this video is very well prompted by Rolex's releases at Baselworld this year. Now, of course, it's very difficult to ignore the fact that Baselworld released, um, uh, or ba Baselworld was the, the place of release of the new single red Sea Dweller from Rolex. And of course, this is a, uh, a 43mm version of the Sea Dweller, which personally I, I found really was 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 counterintuitive and went against really what the Sea Dweller is. Um, but I feel to explain this better I should talk about the entire history of the watch and how it's evolved over the years. Now before I talk about the Sea Dweller itself, I think I should talk about the watch which was the precursor of it and probably the, um, the inspiration for it. And this is the Rolex Reference 5514. And this is a model which was made specifically for Comex, the, the French diving company. Um, because they had problems with watches exploding under decompression. Now, to explain this, and I'm sure many of you already know this, but um, just to cover the, the details, these watches, uh, when uh, when saturation diving became a, a major uh, use due to, to oil, um, uh, oil exploration under the sea, and divers had to saturate in, um, in various gases, notably helium, um, helium could, could uh, infiltrate the case via the seals, and... Uh, and of course, because it entered the case at pressure, when you reached, uh, when you uh, returned to surface pressure, if you will, this uh, this exerted a force on the inside of the crystal and uh, would would effectively explode, which could be quite violent and uh, and could in fact cause harm. So as a result, Comex uh, looked to to various brands, Rolex and Omega, for solutions. And uh, though Omega released various interesting watches, notably the Seamaster 1000 um, and the Ploprof. Rolex, in the end, were more successful in that they received um, the, the ability to produce watches specifically for Comex with a helium escape valve. So that's the, the valve which allows helium to escape from the watch during decompression, which has become really a staple of the Sea Dweller lineup. Now one can see these versions of these watches uh, with either Comex on the dial and the case back, or just on the case back. Um, and this denotes the fact that they were made specifically for Comex, and these weren't available for the purchase of the general public. They were specifically owned by the Comex company, uh, making them very rare and very, very sought after as submariners. But these still feature the 200 meter water resistance of a standard submariner, and the no-date li uh, dial layout. Um, so in a sense, I find these are uh, quite similar in terms of their purpose. Um, two watches, uh, for example, the, the Mill Subs and the, uh, the Blue Tudors issued to the, uh, the French Navy. Um, in that they, they were designed specifically for diving and no real other purpose. Now before I get on to the, the 1665, which is the, the first of the double reds, um, and probably the most famous of the Sea Dwellers, I would like to talk about the, uh, the, the single red. And this was a version of the Sea Dweller which um, I've heard there are less than 10 examples of um, in the world, um, or at least known examples in the world. And these are versions of the Sea Dweller with a single line of red text denoting simply Sea Dweller on the dial, and then uh, 500 meters as the, the depth rating of these watches. Now, as was shown by later models, they were capable of 610, but, uh, but it's thought, um, there are various theories as to how these watches came into being, but they were issued to uh, either divers or, uh, or testers, um, specifically for the, these watches to be, um, uh, to, to be tested to, to the, the full, uh, full length of their ability. Um, for Rolex to really judge what they needed to adjust on these watches before the full release. It was in 1967 that the, the 1665 was released, and this is the Rolex Double Red Sea Dweller. And this is a, a watch which truly, um, I think, caught my imagination um, as far as uh, Rolex divers went, um, due to the fact that it, it's, it's an incredibly technical and, uh, and very um, uh, purpose-driven watch. Um, now this watch does feature the date, um, but no Cyclops, um, which which I think is a, a good thing on these watches. Personally, I prefer non-Cyclops Rolex models to versions with the Cyclops, but that's very much a matter of personal preference. But these watches featured the um, uh, the, the, the the caliber uh, from Rolex 1575, which uh, beat at uh, 19,800 vibrations per hour and was hacking. And this was a movement which was used in in all the the, the, the Sea Dwellers until uh, until really the the, the 70s. So. It was a very, very versatile movement, but of course these watches were known for their two lines of red, uh, red writing on the dial, notably Sea Dweller and then Submariner 2000 beneath that, um, which, and of course these watches were capable of 610 metres, um, allowing these watches to, to, to really be extremely useful for, for this new age of deep sea diving, with the addition of that helium escape valve for saturation diving. Now the early uh, 1967 Mark I versions 
featured the patent pending um, symbol and uh, and writing engraved on the case back. That was denoting the fact that the, uh, the helium escape valve was uh, was not yet a Rolex patent. Um, and of course, uh, this had to be demonstrated on the watch. Additionally, the printing on these watches is known for fading quite substantially, and notably the writing, um, where the red of the, 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 the red sea dweller um, inscription on the dial is known to fade to a pink um, over the years on these early dials. These watches also feature the, the so-called Rolex thin cases, um, which is, uh, is differentiated from later models due to their thicker cases. Now the first versions with uh, with the Rolex um, uh, statement of Rolex uh, patent oyster gas escape valve um, on the case back after the, the valve had actually uh, become a Rolex patent um, was the Mark II. And this version is known for its rather quirky dial aspects, which, uh, w which really don't hold with the Rolex quality that one would expect. Notably the fact that the, the printing, uh, notably um, on the lower text, for example the Sea Dweller, the W and the D are touching, um, which which makes the which I think throws the, um, the the printing a little bit. Also, they're known to have uh, what are, what's often uh, referred to as smudge crowns, which are badly printed coronets where one has little blobs um, surrounding the, the 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 printing, which which does make this um, this bizarre aspect of, of a slightly um, less carefully uh, built and uh, and and designed dial, um, but certainly does differentiate these Mark II 1968 dials from other versions. Additionally, these dials are known to fade over time to a brown, um, becoming tropic dials, um, which are, are very much sought after in a similar way to tropical dial uh, sp speedmasters or, or submariners, um, which does give this uh, this particular look, which, um, uh, which which is an acquired taste, but certainly does add to the value of these watches. Now, the cases used on these watches were still the thin cases from Rolex, um, rather than being those thicker cases seen on later models. Now, the Mark III version of this watch, or dial rather, is my, my definitive favourite Rolex Sea Dweller. And this is a watch which I like very, very much because it is, in my opinion, the definitive Sea Dweller, because it was the first to adopt the thicker case um, seen on later models. Additionally, this was, I think, the model where the, the dial of the watch was perfected to its, its, its really utmost quality. One still has the, the long triangle at 12 o'clock, um, which, uh, which was kept for a while, but uh, it also has a much better finished crown and, and much, much higher quality printing on the dial. The most notable change, though, on this watch is the coronet at uh, at 12 o'clock. And though the printing on the rest of the dial is, is really improved heavily over the Mark II, the, the, the coronet really is a, um, a very clear um, and, and I think very interesting fi uh, fit, fitting uh, part to this watch. And that's the fact that the, the, the various um, uh, parts of the crown aren't spaced out um, in the same way as later models. But it doesn't feature that blobbiness and features very, very crisp, sharp printing. Um, uh, which, which of course wasn't seen on the Mark II versions, which makes this watch a, a beautifully finished model and, and really a very, um, uh, a very tool-driven model, as were all, all the models in this, uh, this lineup. But I feel this is the best executed of the, the 1665s. Now, where the Mark III is, uh, is arguably rarer than the Mark II, the Mark IV is probably the most, um, uh, most well-known and, uh, and most celebrated version of these, uh, these 1665s. And these ones are, are are available for prices around the twenty five thousand pound mark, and of course for for the least rare model that is a, a remarkably high price. But um, it is a very particular sort of market um, in terms of these watches because they were such um, uh, su such uh, uh, pieces which were designed very much for professionals, so therefore very few remain in in good condition. So of course this watch is uh, is the nineteen seventy one model, and. The main uh, changes to this watch are the fact it has a wider coronet, um, and that's very much one of the very few differentiating differences um, between this and a Mark III. And it has that wider uh, setup uh, stance to the coronet, which means that it um, it takes up a, a wider space on the dial, and in my opinion is less true to the original uh, and older Rolex coronets, but nonetheless is a, a very little price to pay for uh, an incredibly um, uh, heavily reduced price compared to, to the Mark III's. And of course, these watches are all astronomically priced due to their rarity. Um, but I must say, any collection with a 1665 is, is quite some collection. Now, other than this coronet, very, very little has changed, and the, the case remains the same uh, thick style of case, um, along with the, the same matted dial and, uh, and finishing, and the same inscriptions too, and with Submariner 2000 still written there, um, which is something which isn't seen on more, model, uh, more modern versions, and, and, and I think is quite an attractive feature. Following the rather long tenure of the, the Mark IV, there was the, the what is known as, among collectors, the Great White. And this was only made in 1978, um, and was the only Sea Dweller on sale at that point. 
and it's identical to all other 1665s, and this is the last of the 1665s. Um, and it's the same as the double reds, other than the white printing on the dial. And uh, these are rather rare, um, not as rare as some of the reds, but um, but they're certainly rare due to the fact that uh, they were only made for, for just under a year, um, making them uh, some somewhat uh, of an oddity, because they're the only white um, uh, white inscription uh, sea dwellers um, before we went to the, the Sea Dweller 4000. Of course, otherwise, these watches retain the, the thick case of the late 1665s, um, as well as the other dial features, notably the larger crown, um, but with this white uh, white layout and uh, the, the great white name, um, certainly are an interesting piece, and are, are a piece which I think a lot of a lot of people who like watches often don't notice, um, and I can entirely understand why. I, I wasn't terribly well informed on these until I looked into them, um, because, of course, it's very easy to mistake one for a later Sea Dweller 4000 if one only looks at the watch briefly. Now, the watch released in late 1978 was the 16660, and this is the, the probably the most uh, produced model of the Sea Dweller in, uh, in Rolex's um, history of producing this watch. And despite a, a few small um, uh, modifications to the watch over the years, this ran effectively from 1978 to 2008, and that really is proof of a watch which was uh, superbly designed for its purpose. Now, the modifications to this watch are, are very substantial in terms of the changes to the watch, the case, uh, for a start, was still 40mm, but featured very attractive bevels on the lugs, and a greater attention to the detail to make the watch a more aesthetically pleasing model. Additionally, gone was the, the heavily domed uh, acrylic crystal, which I personally love on the Mark III, or on any 1665 for that matter, and, uh, and in was a, a new sapphire crystal. Um, equally, the, the calibre had been modified and changed, um, and uh, instead of having the, the original movement, it now had a 30-35 Rolex in-house calibre, which beat at uh, 28,800 vibrations per hour, which is, of course, the standard uh, for the industry um, these days, but, um, uh, but was still a, a, a very um, high-quality movement for, for the era, and, uh, of course, was a chronometer. Additionally, the, um, uh, the, the general um, uh, design of the watch was changed with that increased water resistance um, of 1,220 metres, thus doubling the water resistance from 2,000 feet to 4,000 feet, and making the watch an altogether more um, more attractive dive watch for uh, for the very experienced and uh, and professional divers. This watch also featured a much uh, improved bracelet with solid links um, and improved end links, as well as having a um, a reworked helium escape valve which was larger and uh, and altogether more reliable, um, which which complemented the the more rugged movement uh, very very well. Additionally, these watches really are the watch which I think prove, um, to, to me at least, what, uh, what the Sea Dweller is as a truly professional dive watch in this era. And the reason for this is that this watch was a no-frills watch. Um, these, these watches uh, were, were made purely for diving. There were no gold versions, no two-tone versions, um, and no, no versions other than the standard steel model um, with the date and no cyclops. This was a watch designed specifically for someone who wanted a rugged Rolex, for really any situation, especially in the sea. Now, skipping forward to 2009, the the uh, the Sea Dweller 4000, as we knew it, was discontinued, and this sparked a, a great deal of uh, of disliking from the watch community, um, because a, a favourite, really, of uh, of a lot of us had been discontinued and replaced with the Deep Sea. And of course, the Deep Sea is a 44 mm timepiece. Um, which, uh, which is a substantial uh, chunk on the wrist, um, but certainly does uh, uh, effectively work um, with its purpose of being an extreme depth dive watch. Now water resistant to 12,800 feet, um, which is uh, 3,900 meters and is well, uh, w well over three times the, 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 the rating of the original watch, um, or at least the watch it's, it's uh, superseded, making this an incredible leap forwards in terms of water resistance for the brand. Of course, this, this watch retained the helium escape valve and, and also now had a system whereby there was a, um, uh, effectively a, a ring lock system in the watch, which allowed this greater water resistance to be, to be achievable. Also, a ceramic bezel was now fitted to the watch to, um, to, to, to enable uh, a greater scratch resistance, and this is fully graduated all the way round to, to make the watch altogether more legible to the, the diver who's using it. Now, beating inside this watch was the Calibre 3135, which was the direct successor to the, um, uh, the 3035 used in the previous models. And one can tell with this watch that it was built for a smaller timepiece. Um, and I say this with the best will in the world, because um, Rolex did pr put some, some very impressive engineering into this watch, and um, with a 5mm thick sapphire crystal. 
but the, 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 the movement can clearly be seen with the, the regards to the date wheel. Um, it doesn't quite fit, if you see what I mean. The, um, the date is placed very, very closely into the centre of the dial, rather than being spaced further out, as on uh, other models. Um, really showing the movement wasn't quite the right size for this watch. Though that said, I, I have really very little to complain about with this watch, as it really was a, 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 an impressive step forward. Now the next watch to talk about is a watch made by Rolex specifically for James Cameron's dive to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. And this is the deepest part of the ocean on Earth, um, and is just shy of 12, uh, 11,000 metres um, to its uh, uh, deepest point. And um, this Sea Dweller is, is rated 12,000 metres, uh, and is an incredible size. The watch is 28.5 millimetres thick by 51 millimetres in diameter, making it a truly immense timepiece that wasn't in any, in any way conceived for, for human use, but was strapped to the, um, the, the robotic arm of the submersible um, to, uh, to be used um, and, uh, uh, and to be shown as a technological exercise by Rolex on the bottom of the, uh, the ocean. Of course, this watch is, um, is really the, um, uh, the grandchild of the, the watch which went down with, um, with the, 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 uh, the Bathyscaphe Trieste um, on its dive better down to that depth back in the 60s. And, and of course, this, this was a watch made by Rolex um, in that case as well. So Rolex did want to repeat this, um, this event with a newer timepiece. Of course, the irony of this model is that it, um, it doesn't have a helium escape valve because it was of no purpose and just uh, provided another point of entry for water. So as a result, uh, Rolex didn't include it on this watch. And I can understand why, but I think it would have been nice for a Sea Dweller to, uh, to have that, um, that traditional touch on it. Um, though, of course, that, uh, that is uh, really too much to ask for when one's trying to produce a watch of, of such um, capabilities. Of course, in 2014, the, the D-Blue version of the, the Deep Sea was released to commemorate this dive with probably one of those beautiful dials made by Rolex of all time, with a, a fading blue to black showing the dive of the submersible, with deep sea in the same green as the sub was, was painted, creating a, a really fantastic piece, and one that, uh, if it wasn't 44mm, I, I think would be an incredible success among most um, dive watch enthusiasts. That said, of course, um, it isn't the same watch that went down to that depth, but nonetheless is um, it's still an, an impressive piece of Rolex technology. Now, I feel these watches will be very valuable in future due to the fact that these dials um, on these watches were... It was, this was the first time that a dial was made specifically to commemorate an event um, by Rolex, and, uh, and is uh, truly an impressive move for Rolex, because usually they're very, very conservative with what they will commemorate and what they won't. It was, however, this year the release of the Rolex Sea Dweller 4000 that, uh, that really did grab at the, um, the hearts and minds of, of uh, Rolex collectors and lovers. And this was the return of the 40mm 4,000-foot uh, diver, which we all loved from the past. And this has the, the fully graduated ceramic bezel as taken from the, the deep sea, which was, I think, a very welcome addition. Um, but it retained the matte dial of this watch, along with the, um, uh, the, the slightly less uh, bolstered um, style of, uh, of lug seen on the Submariner, which retained a much more classic air. But of course, this watch remained a 1,200-metre diver with a helium escape valve and, uh, and uh, extremely high legibility with a very simple layout to make this watch an extremely practical choice for a diver. Then we come to the, the 2017 release of the Sea Dweller. And this is an interesting watch, but one which I feel ultimately I've been a little bit disappointed by. Now, this is a recreation of the single red Sea Dweller with a 4,000-foot um, depth rating and, and the graduated bezel. But I think it's the fact that this watch is 43mm with a Cyclops that really, I think, throws collectors of this watch. And of course, this does feature the new uh, 3235 movement from Rolex, which is, uh, is more accurate and uh, an altogether better finish than previous models. But it's very difficult to get over these changes to the watch, which don't really play with the history of the watch very well. Now, I think the reason why this watch has received a great deal of, of negative press is because really there are two sets of people who buy Sea Dwellers. There are those who want a, um, a 40mm dive watch with higher and higher capabilities and, and a more interesting history to a submariner. And of course this watch being 43mm doesn't appeal to that, that market. And also this watch um, doesn't appeal to the market of those who want a submariner without a cyclops, because of course this watch has one. So this creates a, a great deal of alienation, I feel, in terms of the market that the 4000 had. Um, which is a shame because I, I think uh, that a, a, a red um, a red dial a four thousand would have been an incredibly large success. Of course, the problem with this watch is is it uh, it sits too close to the the, the deep sea at forty three millimeters, meaning it's no more wearable um, really to the average person. 
which means that really this watch becomes simply a less expensive uh, version of a deep sea, which, which I, I think is, doesn't really pay homage to the wonders of this line. Anyway, I do apologise for the rant, um, but, uh, but, but uh, I, I think you can understand um, the way I feel this watch doesn't really fit with the history of the watch. Nonetheless, though, it's, it's an incredible lineup and is truly my favourite model from the Rolex collection um, over the years, um, especially, of course, the Mark III uh, Red um, 1665. But anyway, I shall end this video here, and I, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please do like, share, and subscribe to help the channel and to enjoy more content and, uh, and more videos in future. So thank you very much for watching. This is Arm on the Watch Guy, over and out.